In this video, I'm going to take this one pound of extra lean ground beef and dehydrate it so it's something I can add to trail meals at a later date. If you're interested, keep watching. Some time ago, I released a video on preparing budget trail meals, and that video dealt with how to put together common materials into a packages that you could then use out on the trail for preparing lunches and the like. A lot of those materials were dehydrated vegetables and other ingredients, things that you can purchase locally. One comment that I had quite often on that video was, how did I prepare my dehydrated meats? So that's what I thought what I would do with this video, is show you what the process I go through for making what's commonly known as gravel. That's because of what it looks like when it's finished, but actually it's just dehydrated lean ground beef. All right, before we get too far into the process of how I cook and dehydrate my ground beef, I just want to talk about the ingredients and shelf life for a few minutes. So I always use extra lean ground beef. Now for this video, I bought it just a one package portion, but most of the time I'm keeping my eyes open to, for when it goes on sale. So if I can get a larger tray of extra lean ground beef on sale, I'll bring it home, divide it up into smaller portions and freeze those and then when I'm ready to turn it into the dehydrated ground beef, I'll defrost it, cook it, dehydrate it, and then I can be ready to package it away. So if you can get it on sale, you're much better off. You can get away with using lean or even a medium ground beef. The problem is residual fat. So any fat left in the meat after it's cooked is going to affect shelf life. It won't be too long if there's a lot of fat in it. It won't be too long before it goes rancid. And you'll know when you open it up because it's going to smell bad. So if you can get extra lean ground beef, better off. And even with that, I'm going to show you how to remove any fat that may be left over during the process. So let's just talk about shelf life for a few minutes. Probably the most common question I get when it comes to making dehydrated ground beef is how long will it last? Well, I'll tell you for me personally, I have extra lean ground beef that was dehydrated very dry, vacuum sealed and kept in my freezer. And when I opened it up in well in excess of a year later, it was still good. I'm not going to suggest that you do the same, but I will tell you is that there are a few factors that affect it that you can use to make it last longer. So begin with extra lean ground beef, dry it as much as you possibly can at a reasonably high temperature, vacuum seal, put it in the freezer. That's how you're going to get your longest shelf life. How long will it last? Well, different authorities had different recommendations. I've seen between six months and two years. So I go with a year if it's kept that way and I, I haven't had any go bad on me yet. If you don't vacuum seal it, you don't freeze it, you just keep it in, a, in an airtight container like a Ziploc bag, expect a three or four months. So if you're, that's the way you're going to keep your dried beef, then you're better off making it shortly before you use it when you go on the trails. So those are some good factors. Now, there's some downsides to making extra dry lean ground beef. One is it's harder to rehydrate. The drier it is, the longer it takes to rehydrate. Now that's not a problem if you're simmering. You can put it in before you put in the rest of your vegetables and give it a little time to rehydrate and regain some water in it and it will be okay. You can leave a little bit of fat in it if you want to. It will then rehydrate a little quicker. It'll also taste a little bit better. The problem is, of course, shorter shelf life. So that's up to you. I prefer to make it as dry as possible. I'll make sure that I just have a little extra simmer time for it before I add my vegetables, and that way I'm sure that the meat not going bad. Okay, let's get started with the process of preparing our meat for dehydration. So for this video, I've decided to do two things. I'm going to uh, take half of my pound of meat and I'm going to dehydrate it or prepare it the same way I normally would. And for the other half, this half, I'm going to try something I have not tried before, which is to add breadcrumbs. So I have some breadcrumbs here that I'm just going to, literally going to mix in probably by hand, <laughs> get my hands all nice and greasy. But the purpose of adding the breadcrumbs, so I understand, is that it will help the meat rehydrate much better when you go to cook it. So it should be much more palatable, not so gravelly. Now, I also understand that when you do add the uh, breadcrumbs to it, what it's doing is it's actually holding on to some of the fat. 
So once again, you're going to have some fat left over in your gravel, your dehydrated ground beef, when you're finished. So that's going to shorten the shelf life some. So you just have to be aware of that. That, And I'll remember, of course, because I'm going to mark it on the bags that I put it in, that this will not have the same shelf life that this one will, which will be extra lean by the time I'm finished in the process. So what I'm going to do is mix this up by hand and uh, we'll be cooking that one. But first, I'm just going to cook the regular uh, extra lean with no additives. So good time to point out that you don't add any spices, any salts, anything else to this. I mean, I suppose you can, but that's going to impact the end flavor. So most people, myself included, like to leave this as plain as possible so that you can adjust the taste of your meal on the end where you prepare it. You don't want to be predetermining that it's going to be spicy, salty or whatever at this point. So my recommendation is just to leave it as plain as possible. Add your spices when you're cooking up later in the field. Okay, so I'm going to mix this up and have that set aside. And in the meantime, I'm going to start this frying and I'll show you what that looks like in the fry pan. All right, here's my half pound of extra lean ground beef. Fry pan is hot. And I'm just going to start to break it up. So break it up as much as you possibly can. The smaller and the more consistent the sizes of ground beef are, the better it is for dehydrating because it'll be more evenly dehydrated. And the better it is for rehydrating at a later point. So this does take a little bit of time. I'm not going to make you watch me go through the whole process. So I'll just show you me starting out here. And then I'll show you what the finished project looks like for the finished cooked meat looks like before we go to the next step. Okay, our ground beef is ready. I'm very impressed. Very little fat. I can still see a little bit of oil in the bottom of the fry pan, but it seems to have been really, really nice lean ground beef that I was able to purchase. Uh, my beef is all thoroughly cooked broken down as small as I can reasonably get it by just constantly you know, pushing the ground the pieces apart like this. I have a little bit of browning on the meat which is nice. That just adds to the flavor a little bit. So the next step from here is to take it over to the sink where I have a metal colander ready to put the meat in because even though it doesn't look like there's any fat in here, there is and we're going to try and wash off any extra fat that we can. Hi folks, well this is a little embarrassing. It turns out when I was editing this video that I discovered that I had failed to hit the record button for the segment where I was rinsing the ground beef off in my sink. So to be quite honest, it was a simple process. I literally took this uh, stainless steel colander, put it in my sink, put the ground beef from the fry pan right in that, and then just ran hot water, the hottest water that I had running out of the tap. I didn't have to use boiling water. I also used the spray attachment and just made sure that all the beef was under the hot water for a period of time and then let it drain and then I put it on some paper dowel and patted it dry and then I was able to transfer it to the dehydrator. Okay, so I've begun the process of mixing the breadcrumbs into the ground beef. And it's going to take a minute or two to knead these two things together before I put them in the fry pan. Uh, something I wanted to mention earlier, I still worth mentioning now, is in the first half of this batch, I put it right in the fry pan after I had broken it up, or I broke it up in the fry pan, I guess. As an alternative, you can take your meat, break it up, put it in boiling water, and simmer it for a period of time before transferring it into the fry pan. And by doing that, quite a bit of the fat will float to the surface of the water. So you've already removed a good amount of fat even before it hits the fry pan. One thing that's going to be different, I believe, not having done this method before, one thing that's going to be different is that I won't be rinsing this under the tap after it's fried up on the fry pan, I'm going to have to use a slightly different method of removing any residual fat. All right, that's all kneaded in. So now I'll put this in the fry pan and uh, we'll cook it the same way. So I expect this is going to cook up very much the same as the last batch did. 
I don't know, it'll take a little longer. It seems to be a little thicker right now, but when you knead Hamburg, it tends to get a little thicker as well. So, I'll work on this and get this all fried up and I'll show you what the next step of preparing the ground beef that's mixed with breadcrumbs is. So now the second batch, the batch of ground beef that was mixed with the breadcrumbs seems to be all nicely cooked up. A couple of the observations. One is I don't see any fat in the bottom of the fry pan this time. Not that there was a lot last time, but there's zero left over now. I'll tell you, it smells nicer. Not that there was anything wrong with the regular ground beef, but this actually has just a nicer smell, obviously due to the breadcrumbs. And the other thing, it seems to have browned a little bit more, again, due to the breadcrumbs. So, the next step is to transfer this over onto a plate that has paper towels in it, because we're going to blot or press out any residual fat that we can. And as we dry it, we may have to do the same. My understanding is that sometimes as it's in the dehydrator, some of the residual fat will come to the surface. Now, just before I do that, uh, I recognize that I did not say how much breadcrumbs I added to the ground beef. Truth is, I didn't measure it. It appeared to be between an eighth and a, a quarter of a cup. So that was for a half pound. I used, we'll say, less than a quarter of a cup for a half pound of beef. So I might use half a pound or half a cup of ground breadcrumbs to a full pound of beef if I was to do this again. But I guess first we have to see how this turns out. All right, that looks like it's ready, and now I'm going to transfer it over to the plate and see if we can't blot any of the fat out. All right. I really do like the smell of this. hope this turns out well. I guess it does look like it's going to be better. Okay, put the fry pan aside. Once I've got it pressed out, I'll uh, show you the difference between with and without the breadcrumbs. You know, that's not soaking up much fat. I am impressed. And of course, that has everything to do with the fact that I use the extra lean ground beef. A little bit of fat maybe, but not much. Hmm, okay. I don't know if you can see the difference. Make sure I'm in camera frame here. This is the extra lean without the breadcrumbs, and this is with. You can see it's darker browner. Now I'm also going to do some measurements here just to see how much the, the weight is be before and after cooking. And I'll do that again at, after the dehydrating process. I think it's interesting to know just how compact and how light, lightweight it'll, it'll get. But these are now ready for the dehydrator. Okay, I brought my ground beef down to the dehydrator. So the dehydrator's already been running. Uh, you'll probably be able to see some meat inside of here. Uh, that's not jerky. That is for another project that I am making a video of. So that one will be for a later date. It is strips of the leanest beef that I could find. It's cut very thin. It has no spices, no ingredients added to it at all. I'm just drying it as dry as I can, and I'm drying it at about 160 degrees Fahrenheit, which I'm able to do with this uh, dehydrator that I have. It's a Hamilton Beach, if anybody's interested. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to set the dehydrated ground beef on two trays, so I'll be able to distinguish them. And on each of the trays, I have a very fine screening. So this screen is actually made from fiberglass uh, screening that you would use for a storm door because the temperature doesn't get so hot that it affects the fiberglass but it does give me the smallest pore holes, pore size holes or the smallest holes possible to still allow air to go through. The uh, tray that uh, or the tray liner that came with this is, is like this. And the holes in this, as small as they are, are still too large for the ground beef. What happens as the dehydrated beef, or as the beef dehydrates, it shrinks and it falls through. So I want to prevent that. So that's, I've been doing this for a number of years now, using this type of screening, and it's worked out very well. I'm needing all three trays, only two. 
So I'll spread this out. In spreading it out, you want to try to get it as evenly spread out and spaced around your tray as possible and in as thin a layer as you possibly can. Now, it looks like this is right at the limit of what I should have on a tray. This is half a pound of the lean ground beef. This is the one that's been mixed with the uh, breadcrumbs. But no, that's going to work. Okay. I was a little worried that I had too much for this tray. It looks like a half a pound is about the max one of these trays will hold. And it won't take long before that starts to shrink and there's more space around the granules to allow even more airflow to go through. Put that one aside. And here's the ground beef that has nothing added to it. Yeah, that actually is quite a difference. There's a difference in volume as well as the color and the smell of the two types of ground beef. So this is actually easily going on this tray. Try to get it evenly spread. All right, that looks pretty good. I'll add those to the dehydrator. I'll start this up, uh, but just before I do, I have it set, as I said, for 160 degrees. I think 145 is about the minimum you want to go. For the raw meat, definitely 145 or above. For the cooked meat, this isn't quite as critical. However, having been cooked, it's not going to hurt it to, to dehydrate a little faster, like the higher heat will, will cause. Uh, it's going to work out just fine. How long? I'm letting it go for six hours now, and uh, then I'll come back and have a look. And I'll know by texture, and I'll, I'll be able to show you that. I'll know by texture whether or not it is ready. All right, I'm going to turn this on, and we'll come back in six hours and see what it looks like. Okay, seven hours of dehydration, and here's what I came up with. So this is the ground beef that did not have the breadcrumbs added, and it started out at 227 grams and is now sitting at 51 grams. So you can see just how much moisture and fat was lost in the dehydration process. On the other hand, here is the... the uh, lean ground beef or extra lean ground beef that had some breadcrumbs and I figure it was about four grams of breadcrumbs. I measured out a little later about the same amount that I added so we'll say 227 plus four grams maybe just over 331. Anyway at, at this point right now it is 96 grams so it is almost twice as heavy as the one without the breadcrumbs. So yes, there is some breadcrumbs added to the weight, but even if you say four grams of, of breadcrumbs, that doesn't account for the difference. What accounts for the difference is the fat and the moisture that's retained. I gotta be honest, when I feel it, and I'll bring it up close to the camera, I don't feel any difference. Maybe a little, you know, they're both the same crumbliness. Let me see if I can show you this. This is the hamburger or the ground beef that was without the the uh, breadcrumbs and here's the one with the breadcrumbs to look at them there's a little bit difference in color and I might say that the one with the breadcrumbs the pieces are a little plumper but they look and feel very much the same so I'm not going to be using these right away in meals I, uh, I don't have to I still have some in other meals that I've already prepared but I'm, I am going to need these in a month or two so what I think I'll do is I'll vacuum seal them and put them in the freezer and that extends the life the longest what I will have to do is at some point on a hike I will make when I'm making a video I'll use the one with the breadcrumbs and maybe I'll even make another meal and have them both just to give you a side-by-side taste test, I guess, if you will. I'm quite interested to see how well these rehydrate. They're supposed to, from what I understand. Okay, let me just put those in a vacuum sealer, and we'll show you what that looks like. Actually, you'd probably like to see that happening. Why don't we do that? That I'll do. start with the non-breadcrumb version. Now, the bag I'm using is much larger than it needs to be for this process. Um, do you know I find it, I can sometimes reuse the bags if I well wash them out because they are a bit expensive. So reusing the bags if you can, if you can uh, will save you a little bit of money. I have written on here 
February 14th, 2020, because that's today, obviously, and 51 grams. So I know how much is in the bag and how much it's going to, or how, when, I, when I made it. So let's just put that in. The seal is in the trough there. Lock her up and vacuum seal. Okay. I love this vacuum sealer, folks. I really do. My wife gave me this a couple years ago as a Christmas present, and it was probably the very base model from Food Saver. But I have done more sealing with it and experimented on different things. I mean, that's as hard as a rock. There is no oxygen left in that at all. So I've already extended the shelf life just by removing the oxygen. Now, if I put it in the freezer, it'll extend it that much longer. It's a great investment. So folks, really, two investments would be just over here, you already saw, would be the uh, dehydrator. And this is one I bought myself when it was on sale, the Hamilton Beach model. I like it quite a bit. There are better ones. And if you want to invest in a better one, I would recommend investing in one that does has more than just high, low, medium settings. One that you can actually set the temperature and it gets above 160, just for doing meat with, of course and investing in a food saver because, you know, they'll save you the money many times over that you would pay for in fresh food or, or in freeze-dried foods even. All right, I'll just do the other one up and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, there I go. I have two packages of dehydrated extra lean ground beef. One just regular and the other one with breadcrumbs. I'm quite excited to try this one with breadcrumbs to see what it's like. And the reason I did that again is because I find the regular stuff, when you make it very dry, which gives you the longest shelf life, takes a little bit longer, quite a bit longer some, in some cases, to rehydrate in simmering water. So this is supposed to rehydrate much faster and retain more flavor. I guess we'll see. So if I didn't mention it, it's worthwhile exploring not only dehydrating extra lean ground beef, but look at some of the other meat products as well, because you can do chicken, you can do fish, and you can do pork. You can probably do, well, you can, certainly I've done it with uh, venison as well. I think you can do just about any type of meat, I don't know of any that you can't, as long as it starts out very, very lean. And then you'll be assured that you have the minimum amount of fat left over when you're finished. Because again, it's the fat that goes rancid, not the meat so much. Oxygen will deteriorate the meat over time. But as I said, if you can get it vacuum sealed and put it in a freezer, you've really extended your shelf life a long time. So each of these packages represents a half pound of meat after, or would have been a half pound of meat before it was dehydrated. So I guess how would I portion that out for a meal? Well, uh, for me, a lot of my meals are soup based. They, I use a lot of dehydrated vegetables and, and other materials to make a soup, sometimes a thick soup, but usually a soup type of a meal. And uh, again, at the end of this video, you're going to see a link to the to the video where I put those meals together. So I would probably use about a quarter pound, maybe a little less in that meal. It doesn't represent a whole lot of protein, but it does add some to the meal. So yeah, probably a quarter pound. So in other words, about half of one of either of these packages to any given meal. So, all right, that's all I have to share with you today. If you have any questions about dehydrating or any suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And in the meantime, until I come up with another video, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it'll make all the difference. Bye for now.